Hi, my name is Paul Grogan and welcome to episode 40 of the Gaming Rules podcast, where I talk about the games that I've been playing and various other things that I've been up to. Joining me in this episode as a special guest is the podfather himself, Stephen Bonacor from Stronghold Games. We're going to be talking about various things, uh, what Stephen's got planned for Essen this year, and to answer a number of the questions which people have asked on the BGG Guild. Thanks to everybody who's asked the questions on the Guild, and for the various other topics that have been posted on there recently. If you listen to this podcast and you want to know how to find me, I'm on Twitter at GamingRulesVids, the Facebook and YouTube channel is Gaming Rules Videos, and the BGG Guild number is 2258. Thanks as always to the sponsors of the show, GamesLaw, the UK's largest specialist games retailer at GamesLaw.com. Gaming Rules News. So the run-up to Essen is probably the busiest time of the year. That's not to say that it's quiet any other time of the year, but my actual workload in the last month or so has really fluctuated. The Gloomhaven job was going to be a massive piece of work, and it was originally planned for July, but it, it kept getting put back and back, and it's now going to be filmed after Essen. Now, I'm doing two videos for Gloomhaven, um, the first of which is pretty much done and that's going to be using all digital footage but the second video is going to be a lot longer and if I was to do that using digital footage it would take me like two months to do and and I don't have time for that so the second video is going to be predominantly used using real footage and of course there's been delays in production so that's now not going to arrive until after Essen. Now what that means is that a large chunk of work which I've been planning to do suddenly I'm not planning to do but... That actually worked out because there was a whole load of other urgent work that came up that I wasn't able to do that I suddenly was able to do. So, other things that I've been working on. Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective. Uh, Space Cowboys came back to me after we'd gone through, uh, we've done all of the editing for all of the new 10 cases of that and they wanted another check. They also wanted the directory checking. Basically, we're having to go back over it and check everything again in detail. So that's gonna take a lot more time. I've also been working a lot with Watch Your Game on helping set up playtest sessions for their new game, Railroad Revolution. Now, this has only just appeared on BGG. So, a lot of people who've already done their Essen lists, and a lot of people that are talking about what games are coming out at Essen, this game didn't even have a BGG entry until a week ago. So it's Railroad Revolution. This is going to be Watch Your Game's new game for 2016. Um, I'm organising the online playtesting sessions at the moment using Tabletopia, and I'm going to be working on the rulebook for this very soon as well. I'm also working hard on the video for Adrenaline. Now, this for those people who don't know, Adrenaline is the new big box game from Czech Games Edition. It's going to be released uh, at Essen. CG want the video done before Essen, therefore it's all going to have to be done digitally, because obviously the game's not actually ready yet. CG normally produce things very, very close to Essen, so it's likely that this will come off the printers on the Monday, be picked up in the van on the Tuesday, and driven to Essen on the Wednesday. Um, so what that means is I'm going to have to do yeah the whole video in digital 3D. It's going to take forever to do, but I'm hoping to have it complete just in time for Spiel. Um, other things that have been going on, there's lots of other little bits, but um, I've started to appear on the What Did You Play This Week podcasting as a guest. I've just got like a 10 or 15 minute section on each show. So if you want to listen to another podcast, then the What Did You Play This Week podcasting is the other thing that I'm on. Uh, I've also attended my local town fair to try and help promote board games in the local community. And I went to an uh, event, well, it, they meet every two weeks. It's a group of people called the Silver Tops. And they meet at the local community centre in the town where I live. And they basically, it's a group of old retired people. I was invited along to show them um, some games. And I took along code names. Not really for the reason, the fact that I'm trying to promote the game and work for CG. But I just thought it was a great game because they needed something simple and quick that, you know, that didn't take that long to play. It went down interestingly. So next time I go, because I've been invited back... I've specifically said what we need is the people who enjoyed it the first time because there were some people that really enjoyed it, really understood it, engaged with it, got on with it and, and just at the end of it was like, this is really good, this is really clever. There were some other people that just didn't get it. Now, the lady who'd invited me along to the event apologised to me because a couple of people at the first table that she sat me at actually had um, some kind of difficulties and that was a bit of a problem because they didn't really get at all what was going on. But for the people who, who did appreciate it, 
it ran down really well. Anyway, that's uh, that's probably half of the stuff that I've been up to. I've been up to lots of other bits as normal, but I'm not going to go into all the full details. That's the main stuff. What Paul has played. So I've been a bit slack with updates of what I've been playing recently, so I'm just going to cover a couple of them here. I've played a couple of games of the new Mare Nostrum game, which uh, was on Kickstarter, and backers have now started to get their copies, and a friend of mine got his copy, and I have to say, he bought the copy with the 3D cities and pieces, and they're really, really nice. The moulding on, they're like a hard plastic. They're really nice, it really does improve the game for me. Now, I played one five-player game, a one-player, one six-player game. I did like the game. Um, I do need to play it a few times more. I remember playing the original game when it when it first came out, um, but that you know that was a long, long time ago. So this new game, it seemed to end early. Now it's not a long game. Our first game ended on round four, and it was at the start of round four in the building stage where the Egypt player had managed to get twelve coins, built the pyramids, game over. So we'd actually only had three rounds of play. Now when you know the game a bit more, you can probably watch out for what the Egypt player is trying to do, but eventually, as everybody's increasing, you know, the stuff that they're getting, sooner or later somebody is going to win. The second game we played ended on round five. Again, it ended at the start of round five, so we only actually had four rounds, and that was another pyramid building. So that is, seems to be the easiest way to win. The other ways do seem a lot harder to win, but again, I'm only a couple of games in. Um, I do want to play it a bit more. I'm not sure about the game at the moment, the second game was interesting because the guy who, who was next to me built up loads of military units. Now, what that meant is I had to build loads of military units as well. Otherwise, he would have moved in, attacked me and taken a half of my stuff. So what I did is I built some military units in defense, which meant he couldn't attack me. I couldn't attack him. And basically what we did is we, we'd, we'd wasted one of our turns each just building up forces. So, while the other players in the game were expanding and doing their stuff. So, yeah, need to play a couple more games of that. I've also been playing a lot of Gloomhaven, or more showing it to other people, showing the prototype, uh, running people through the first scenario to give them a glimpse of what the game is about, so that when the game does come out, they know whether or not it's something that they want to play. Um, I think it will be available at retail eventually, so yeah, I'm just trying to introduce more people to it. I think it's amazing. Really, really enjoying it, and I can't wait for the actual fin finished product to arrive so that I can start playing through. I've actually got my group of four now all ready together. We're eagerly awaiting the game coming out so that we can actually get started on it. And I've played a few games of Cry Havoc. Now, despite working on the rule book for this game, I'd never actually played it. And that actually makes editing the rules hard. And I think various posts and comments on BGG have been, oh, the rule book's terrible, or it's missing certain things, and things like this. Well, I went back and I was like, well, I, I worked on the rulebook for this game. I went back to it and I read through it and I thought, okay, a couple of the parts of the rulebooks, yeah, it could have been a little clearer that your terrain cards, once you get them, they become part of your deck. It does say that when you play them, they're discarded to your discard pile, so it kind of infers that once you've got one, it is yours for the rest of the game. But that could have been spelled out a bit more. The problem was is that some of the machines and the cards that come with the game, so other components of the game with text on that are not in the rule book, I can see how people are finding them difficult to understand. My first game I played as the machines, I had one building, I think it was the Matrix, and I'm like, right, I've actually no idea how this works. It's like, put a card on it, you can use this in combat, right? When I use it in combat, where does it go? Does it go to my deck or does it go underneath? Can I have one card per building? There was various questions about some of the buildings. Thankfully, um, Portal are on the case, the FAQ is out, more clarifications are going to follow. As far as the gameplay goes, I was a little unsure as to what to expect. In the first game, I basically moved into one area, had a bit of a fight, took that area, and then spent the next three rounds not really getting anywhere. And then the game ended, and I got half the victory points of the winning player. And I was like, oh, right, okay. In the second game, again, I played the machines because I thought I want to get to get used to them. Again, I came third, um, not by as much, but still a good 10, 15 points behind. And I just didn't feel that I was able to accomplish much. Yes, I was building all these buildings and I was, I was sniping things off from around the board, but we were playing four player games and the trogs just used their ability to basically keep respawning. So I could never get enough forces 
I mean, I took more than the one area that I did in the first game, but yeah, I think it's just going to need a couple of plays. There's lots of threads on BGG about, oh, the humans are way too good and all sorts of other things. But, uh, you know, the mechanics of the game is nice. The, the flow of the game is quite nice. Um, I think people might just have different expectations. Last time I played, uh, another friend of mine, Paul, was playing the humans and he won and he was really surprised. Now, me and, me and Simon, we pretty much knew he was going to win just because of the way that the game was going. But he, he spent the whole game struggling to actually do something that he felt he really wanted to do. But in terms of what he was actually accomplishing, in terms of victory points, was actually really good. It just didn't appear that way on the board. You're not going to, you know, like in Risk, where you build a million units and spread across the map, you're not going to be doing that in this game. You are probably just going to be taking over, a, you know, two or three areas and having a few fights. But... It's the way that that all gets put together. Anyway, want to want to play that a bit more. So that's a couple of the games that I've been playing recently. Special guest. So I'm happy to welcome to the show Stephen Bonacourt from Stronghold Games to join me uh, in this week's section. So welcome to the show, Stephen. Hey, Paul. This is awesome. I am so excited to be here, man. Thank you. And you're you're in Indiana at the moment, aren't you? I am in the lovely city of Fort Wayne, Indiana, right. at, at the Alliance Open House. Alliance is the largest distributor mm -hmm. of hobby games in, uh, in North America. Uh, I'm not sure if they're standing across the world, but they're certainly a large customer of Stronghold Games. And uh, they're doing what all distributors do at least once a year, is they bring in retailers and sort of wine and dine them, because that's their customer. Yeah. And then they bring the publishers there, myself, ev every major North American publishers here, and we get to, you know, show them the games, demo games for them, show them what's coming up, and, and just, you know, get to know get to know the retailers that are, that are, you know, selling our games to the end consumer. Excellent, excellent. Now, a lot of people know that you're the guy behind Stronghold Games, which I think is fair to say it's a very successful publisher of board games. Thank you. But first, let's just, let's just put that aside. <laughs> a little bit about Stephen Bonacor himself. Oh, I'm not interesting. You don't want to know about me. <laughs> well so you live in new jersey yes okay we'll start that's about all i know that's all you know really oh okay <laughs> well no, i know more but I, this is about you I yeah want you to talk. okay so yeah so um stephen bonacore uh grew up uh as a little boy in uh, in Queens, New York, uh, lived lived in New York City. Queens is one of the boroughs uh, for half of my life, and now the second half of my life, I'm uh, live in New Jersey. So people kind of know me uh, from from New Jersey. Uh, I've I've been um, in IT in on Wall Street for my entire career. Right. So that's really that's my background, and I have um you know I have a, a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in finance so i you know i i had a a good career in um in in it on wall street so i had to like of course you know do something to to lose money or not make money in uh, in yeah. hobby gaming of course right you know <laughs> the old joke is like you know how do you make a small fortune in gaming start with a big fortune so uh, yes. <laughs> not, not that i had not that i had either but um no stronghold games is is successful and you know i i thought that um i would um you know bring some of that background that I had, you know, um, my, the, the education and, and the background in, in business in general, and bring that to, uh, to bear, you know, in a, a hobby game company. Yeah, because you're a gamer. Because I am a gamer, and I've been a gamer for my entire life. Oh, there's no, no ifs, ands, or buts. And I went through, like, all kinds of, like, when I, you know, obviously when you're young, uh, and especially in, in the United States, it was a, a you know, a, a monopoly and shoots mm -hmm. and ladders and candy land and, you know, and then a little bit bigger than that, Parcheesi and just the, the, the standard board games that you would find, you know, in anybody's household kind of thing. That's, that's the things. And, and the game show games, all the mass market stuff. And I played, played them all. It was always... Always, it was like the thing I wanted to do as a kid. I didn't want really necessarily want to go out and play baseball necessarily, yeah. but I really wanted to go out and uh, I just wanted to hang out and uh, and play games with my friends. And we certainly did a, a good amount of that. And then as I grew up, I started realizing that there were these other games out there. So you started buying some of the some of the bigger games and some of the the stuff that like Avalon Hill was putting out as you got into yeah, the teenage I was say, years. Yeah, we talking the Avalon Hill era of of those games, things like Acquire, Axes in Our Lives. 
things like that. Yeah, absolutely got into uh, into those games. Not the not the not like a Third Reich and um, and Advanced Squad Leader. That I leave from some of my buddies actually played. Like I want my buddy Chad Meckish, who does some work for Stronghold. He uh, he has got at least at one point he had more games of. Adva- of advanced squad leader logged on board game geek than anybody else he was like wow added. yeah <laughs> and that's a you know that's like the deepest of the deepest of the heaviest rule set kind of games war yeah. games in the in the world um yeah. so um so you know but i played I, I was playing the lighter stuff and definitely axis and allies big on that um and then of course you know as you grow up you you start moving into other things because like uh, i grew up as technology was right getting mm-hmm. you know the curve was there and like the ibm PC and stuff like that. Oh my God, look at that. All of a sudden we have one of these things. Uh, so, you know, I started doing some computer gaming for a while. Um, definitely did a lot of role playing back in the day. Um, uh, I did CCGs. I was a big uh, fan of Vampire the Eternal Struggle for, right. for yeah. a long time. I don't know if that was also known as Jihad for uh, when it first came out. Yeah. That was like the second, the second big uh, CCG that came out after Magic the Gathering. It's a Richard, yeah. it's a Richard Garfield game. Um, and that has still has a very big fan base out there, and there, but though, though they're not printing uh, the, the game as much, but still a very big, big fan base. Got into that. Um, got into the MMOs. I play. I was a big City of City of Heroes player for a short period of time. Um, okay. World of Warcraft. It was hitting at the same time. I picked City of Heroes because I kind of I don't know. I kind of like the superhero thing. I lost like six months of my life buried in yeah. that game, <laughs> grind, grind that game. I mean, completely. And then you know. And, and in, in the end, then I came back just full circle, and I found these really cool, you know, Euro games from Europe that were coming out. And Rio Grande was the, mm-hmm. you know, was the big thing then. And so all of a sudden, Catan. I'm hearing about the well, Settlers of Catan. I'm hearing about this. We started playing that, and um, uh, Puerto Rico. Oh my God, played the crap out of Puerto Rico for a while. And then I just realized that after playing all these great these great games around a table with my friends sitting together and enjoying that experience, you know, having a beer and socializing together, that this was the kind of gaming that I wanted to do. So I then, from that point on, and that was still well before Stronghold Games, this is the, you know, the, uh, the mid-90s, uh, so the, you know, from that point on, I just... I became an avid board gamer um, and played mostly on the the mid the lighter to mid side of the games, but but that's where I wanted to be in gaming. Right. Uh, so that's where I that's where I stayed. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I can appreciate most of that. I I did a lot of role playing uh, in the 80s and 90s. I got seriously into CCGs, done a lot of MMOs myself, and then I think it was 90, it was the latter half of 98 or early 99, where I just went bang and into board games. And, uh, and basically gave up because I was dabbling with other stuff. I did a little bit of role playing on the side, but that that stopped as well eventually. And then it just straight straight into uh, uh, into board games. And it's been board games all the way now for yeah. I love role playing, and I I would still be doing it mm-hmm. right now. Um, but I just didn't have the I don't have the time anymore to dedicate time. like a night yeah. a week or a night every other week anymore to doing that. So. Um, uh, I lost my group that was playing. So I mean, I, pl- I was an avid, avid D and D player. Yeah, twenty five years I played D and D. Yeah, for, so. absolutely. Yeah. By far was my go to. I played other systems as well, but I um, I played up through um, through uh, three point five. Um, yep. a little Pathfinder uh, there at the end, but that was you know that's when I had to basically say about I don't know four years ago or so. I just I had to end it. You know that yeah. portion, but you know board games are are a passion, a love on every possible level. You know, so that's you know that 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 fills my gaming time very happily. Yeah, me too. So Stronghold Games, mm-hmm. when did it all start then? Uh, Stronghold Games uh, started in late two thousand and nine, when I was I was essentially um, watching the market, seeing you know. That this this thing was was have, getting getting momentum. Things mm-hmm. were think you know more and more games were coming out, and they were all interesting. And um, I thought that I could bring some of that background that I had that I mentioned uh, earlier yeah. on, uh, some of that financial and technology background. Though the technology portion is more about the the process management that one has, because I was uh, doing a lot of project management in IT, and I still yeah. was doing it until very recently. Um, bring all that background in and that knowledge in and do this myself. Um, I'm not a game designer. Never, never, um, 
you know, even consider doing that. I mean, uh, every, right. every, every, every one of us, I think, has like, this is, oh, I have a game in me. Yes. But I'm, but yes. I'm not, but I'm, but I, you know, I, I have enough things to, to use my time on that I'm not going to try to actually bring that one out. I'm going to go to those guys that are, that are smarter than me, game designers smarter than me, and I'm going to find those games. So I want to bring that background and then see if I can find some great designers uh, to, to work with uh, over time. But I did start mm-hmm. with, if you remember, uh, I did start by actually looking for designers that had games that had gone out of print, that games that were, yes. were uh, really sought after by others, uh, you know, in the you know the gamers were you know were getting all these new new things coming out, but then there were games that that they were kind of clamoring for, and they were sp- spending lots of money on eBay and things like that. Yeah. So I would I I, you know, I kind of was searched that way first, and I figured that by by bringing out a game, you know, so an unknown an unknown company bringing out this this really popular you know, game that's out of print from a known designer. So I raised my brand by, by yeah. associating myself with these games like like Code 777, Confusion by Robert Abbott, and Survive. Of course, still my largest yeah. selling and my flagship game uh, for Stronghold Games, Survive Escape from Atlanta. So that's yeah. where we did it. So I wanted to make the mark by getting the name and the brand out there and then grow the company and go out, go after some other great designers in the industry. Okay. So you mentioned IT project management and I, I, I've got a background in IT myself. I was um, uh, mainly in the support area, but I did a lot of project management uh, as well. And when I, when I started gaming rules, I still had that nicely well-paid full-time job. But, you know, there comes a point where you can't survive off two hours sleep a night and <laughs> something, something had to give. Um, and you've recently done the same there's a rumor to that effect isn't there yes there is um as of uh, very recently uh, yeah i i, I literally uh, we just talked about my background there in this i would literally been working for 35 years in in it and so that's my yeah. entire career since i was you know came right out of uh, out of college um and just very recently i pulled the plug on that, I was doing Stronghold Games. I was doing Stronghold Games full time, <laughs> full time, and I was doing this other yeah. job full time. Exactly. So yeah. really, was I mean, it was it, it was it was crazy. Um, so Stronghold Games now, uh, and I appreciate you using the word uh, has you said successful has has now certainly become successful enough where I don't need to be waking up at four thirty in the morning and dragging my <laughs> scraggly butt into Manhattan every day and then staying there late and then getting back and all that stuff. So I, I, I gave that up and now and I can just do the passion job yes. that I think that so many out there probably wish they could do it. I'm blessed, truly blessed that I can that I can do this, something that I'm so passionate about. And I thank you, Paul Grogan, and every person listening to this podcast for the ability to have me do that because it, without you guys, I mean, literally, without the people listening to this podcast, uh, and I assume that they've even they've heard of Stronghold, but most of them have, and yep. probably quite a few of them have purchased a game or played the games. Without all of you, this company would not exist, and yeah. Stephen Bonacore would, would still be working, you know, his horrible, <laughs> no, it was a great job, but he'll still be, you know, doing the, doing the thing that you're not passionate about. This is passion, yes. and this is about that social environment that I've, I've, that I mentioned earlier on, and you know, this is what we want to do with our with our time. We want to we want to spend it together with people, and relax. And this is why this is such a fun thing for me to be doing and creating fun for all of you. I mean, in my in my sort of um, latter months when I still had the full time job, I was yeah, I was getting up at like four or five in the morning. Working on the Panamax and Kanban videos for you. <laughs> That's then right. Going, oh, I've got to go to work now. Went to work. Came back from work. As soon as I came back from work, carried on working on them. And then all weekend, as you say, doing two full-time jobs is... But, you know, I, I had to build up gaming yep. rules before yep. going, is this going to work? Because if I, if I jumped ship and then it didn't work, I'd be like, oh, right, what shall I do now? <laughs> That's right. Stuck. Exactly. So anyway, let's move on to Essen, which is oh, God. Uh, a matter of five weeks away. That's now, right. Stronghold Games has got a lot of releases coming out at Essen. What should people be getting excited about? I mean, it's it's a you know obviously it's the biggest time of the year for all companies mm-hmm. essentially. I mean, it's not it's it's not even a you, you can't even compare the releases that come out during the fourth quarter in in quantity or or quality uh, to the rest of the year. So I mean, Stronghold Games has a lot of stuff. Just yes. re, just um, 
just a week ago, we released the Dragon and Flagon, the new Jeff Engelstein design, um, yep. where you're basically tavern brawling. That was a huge release for us. We also released the co-publication of The Pursuit of Happiness with our Tipia Games, mm -hmm. another big release. Uh, so those are out already, and um, uh, but they'll be there uh, in Essen. Certainly, the Dragon and Flagon will be there in Essen because it'll barely be out yet for, uh, for most of Europe, so it'll be there. Yeah, and then we're going to be rolling big time into the rest of the releases, and the 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 big hit this year uh, for Stronghold is really, and I and I'm I'm flabbergasted by how well the the buzz is and everything is terraforming Mars. Um, it it sold out, and the Dragon Flag, and, and it both sold out in three and a half hours, and there was more terraforming Mars there, and it was a higher priced game too. Yeah. Um, and it's going to be, it's officially street dating at the end of September. The worldwide English street date is September 28th. And it's going to be allocated in, in distribution. And that means, um, for those out there, it means that the supply uh, will not be able to, to meet the demand. Meet the demand, I, yes. Right. I have printed, a, I took, I printed for a first print run m more of this game, at least as many of this game as any other game. It was, uh, it's tied for the biggest print run I've ever done for a okay. first printing of a game. And still, I will not have the, uh, the, the quantity to do. So if people want it, really they should go to their friendly local game stores or friendly online game stores and order it immediately. Yes. But huge game. Um, and the the videos coming out and the buzz around it has been so good. Um, some of the partners in the in the production are saying we should call it "We Were First on Mars" because there's a bunch of Mars games coming out, uh, Huge which, is, which is kind of cool, right? But yeah. you, know, you know, we're like, hey, we're we're the first ones, you know, that made it to Mars. Uh, but, but we had the game, we had the game on time, and we're really really happy about the reception. Yeah, I mean, I, this is on. I, I've got a very short Essen list this year. That's one of the three games that's on there. Because wow. I've heard nothing but po positive things about it. And in fact, correct me if I'm wrong, but Terraforming Mars, some people were playing it last year at Essen. Well, right, the prototype. They were playing the yeah. prototype. Yeah, and there's, there was buzz then. So a lot, a lot of people I know were coming back from Essen last year going, oh, I played this game called Terraforming Mars. It's not going to be out for a while. But So I, unless I'm getting my Mars game mixed up, because as you say, there's a lot of them, but I think that was the one. Oh, absolutely. It, it, it was. Um, right. We... We wanted to have the game out last year at Essen, but it wasn't ready. It simply wasn't ready. And you know, uh, we worked. Uh, the, the, we worked with the Frix brothers, for, uh, Frixilis, Frix Games, Frixilis yeah. Games. Uh, Frixilis is the the name of the. There's nine brothers and four oh, sisters wow. in the Swedish in the <laughs> Swedish family. Yeah, it's a huge family, and they're all part of the company one way or another. The, the, the Jacob is the designer, and Enoch is sort of the business production guy, and great family, great really nice people. Um, and uh, you know, we 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 played it to almost two years ago, uh, and we. We, we said, this is great. I mean, this is really great, but we've got to do a few things here. So, and they were amenable to, to working with us and stuff like that. Uh, so I had Jeff Gamble, I want to give him a shout out, and he worked tirelessly, you know, at like, like refining and tweaking and making everything work just the way it does. Mm -hmm. And that game just clicks really well. So yeah, big release for us. Um, if you're interested in the game, I'm not trying to overhype it. It's going to be sold out and you yes. will not get a copy uh, after I would say, I mean, it'll be at Essen. I have, I have copies at Essen and I'm going to have copies of BGG Con, but if you're looking to buy it in a store, which is fine too, of course, you just put it on your radar and and, and get to it because it will, won't be around at the end of the year. Let's put it that way at no. least, if, if not like no. a month after. But yeah. we have so many more games. I guess we should mention the other ones, right? So yes. From uh, from 2F Spiele, right? That's uh, Friedman Fries's company. Uh, where Which we, you have now we, got a partnership with. That's right. We, we announced yep. uh, earlier, uh, a few months ago, we have a strategic partnership with them, which means we're going to be doing all of their games uh, going forward, mm -hmm. all, of their, all of their new games. Like the current, like ones that they've already had out will stay with the original partner, Power Grid being, right, Friedman's, you know, biggest yep. um, uh, known game. So that stays with Rio Grande, for instance, and things like that. So, and, and, and games that are related to it, like they've announced a card game uh, related to it. But we'll do all the new ones, and they've got two really, really interesting new games coming out this year. Uh, one is a light card game, just just cards, Fuji Flush. They're calling it Fujikado, which is completely uh, unpronounceable and unspellable in English. <laughs> if you look at that, I, I looked at it, I'm like, that looks Japanese to me, but it means like down the drain in German or something like that. Oh, okay. So, we, so, I, I, so I looked at it, I'm like, well, well, 
Friedman, he always does his games with Fs. So I'm like, yes. it looks like yeah. it sounds Japanese to me. So why not Fuji Flush? So that's and 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 flushing cards is part of the 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 game system. And okay. Flush is a a card term anyway in poker. It is so for poker, yeah. So I I thought it was you know between me and and Paul and Kale, we we came like Fuji Flush. That's it. Perfect. Done. So it's a, it's, a, <laughs> it's a simple card game that has that does something so different. You might, basically it's a card shedding game. You're trying to get rid of your cards and. You know, the cards are just have, have numbers on them, 2 to 20, 3 to 8 player game, 2 to 20 number on the cards, and you basically have to have the highest card in front of you when it gets back to you. You play a card, any card, comes back, you have the highest card, you get rid of it. But, okay. well, that doesn't sound like it's too interesting, but the fact, because if I play a 2 and you play something higher, obviously I'm going to have to flush my card. But if I play yeah. a 2 only, the next guy plays a 2, and the next guy plays a 2, those numbers will multiply, or they'll add together. So now, together, we all have a 6. So you gang up on the higher cars and things like that okay. to try to shed your cards. Really, really interesting way. So freedom in again with these really interesting things. Clever ideas, yeah. Yeah, but going further than that, he's got this f- fabled fruit. We're calling this a fable game. It's a, we, We're actually considering this like a new style of game that he's created. Okay. Okay. Um, in a fable game, as we're calling it, the game system starts in a basic state, and you play the game, and you enjoy the game. Uh, in this case, uh, in Fabled Fruit, you are basically trying to collect fruit to create wonderful drinks. So you'll have right. to, like, you'll have to, there'll be, like, you know, drink cards that you'll have to make. And you'll make a, a drink that cries two bananas and, uh, and, and strawberries and, uh, and, and a grapefruit. I don't know, something like that. So you'll collect them to make that. So... Uh, so there's actions that you take to trade cards and to get cards into your hands. And you'll play that with these basic kind of actions. And then as the game progresses, you'll be bringing new actions out, which you don't know about. So there's like, I forgot the number of them in there, but there's, there's these, all of these action cards that are in there. And you'll bring them out in a certain order. So this starts out with these six, and all of a sudden this one is done. Another one, a different one comes out. This one is done, and then another one comes out. You won't know how the game system is going to change over time. You'll play the game at least 20 times before you've played through all of the different kinds of actions that you will be using. Okay. And un- so it's like a legacy game, but the game so the game the game is going to change but never change in a permanent way. Yeah. So your first play of the game will be just as cool as your 20th play of the game, but different but but um but different and then if you want you just can reset the entire game back to its original state and start it again start again okay. yeah and then see i'll do better next time i only was able to score an average of 20 points uh, per per game i'm gonna try to do more next time so okay really really interesting i so we're calling this a fable game and um i think that when people see this they're gonna see another another genius kind of idea from freedom and freeze right okay um we have um Two games with Eggerspieler, which are another strategic partner from yeah. from Europe. We have um, one is called Jorvik, which is a re-implementation of a Stefan Feld game, one of his earlier designs. And I and I'm going to bastardize this German. Die Spiekerstadt was yeah. the game. Near enough. You you know you know the game right? And it also had a, yeah yeah yeah. It I'm also had fan. an ex- right. It also had an expansion called <laughs> Kaiser Sch- Kaiser. Spiker, okay. Kaiser Spiker, something like that, which was never never released in English, I don't believe, or never released in, in North America. So so they it's a great game, especially when you put the expansion in the game. So uh, Egger Spieler being the brilliant guys that they are, took the game, um, combined the base game with the expansion, changed the theme from something mm-hmm. that was this heavy German, it's about a... Dry... It's very dry German kind of thing. No offense to my German friends out there, but but now they made it a Viking theme. So yes. the cover is gorgeous. It's got this you know Viking man and and woman on the cover, um, and uh, the artwork is beautiful. Very you know that very really cool Viking style. Because yeah. Vi- um, Vikings and Mars at the moment are, are the two <laughs> big. So what we need is Vikings on Mars. Vi- that's hey, what we need. May, may, yes, I think that, that, that's my next one. Let me write that down. I'm going to copyright that so quickly. no one else can yeah. use it. There you go. So so this is again, so it's a Stefan Feld game. So we're really proud to have this one in our great designer series as well because you know nobody mm. is, you know, could be considered a great designer if Stel- Feld is not a great designer. Yeah. Um, so this one will be coming out uh, for us and and uh, then we have the. It's called Great Western Trail, and this is a Fister game. Fister I have heard is a lot so about this. hot right now. Yeah, 
I mean, again, we put this in our great designer series as well. He's won Kenner Spiel de Jar two years in a row now. Mm -hmm. uh, Mombasa just was um, it's just also won nominated something. or also won the what's it called this the Deutsche Spieler Prize which is sort of yeah. a voted uh, game it's like not the Spiel de Jar but I think it's voted by fans the Deutsche Spiel Prize something like that yeah. um, so worthy, um, worthy winner definitely yes, love Mombasa very very so Great Western Trail is his next game um, Heavy Euro so people who like that really meaty kind of game you know this is going to be the kind of thing so it's kind of on that um, that weight of a Mombasa a big mm -hmm. a big game that, that's just gone on to my list as well. Uh, there you go. Yeah, I'm gonna have to. Well. I'm gonna keep going here. I mean, I'm gonna try to be <laughs> try to be faster. But I only have a couple more, I guess. But I'm, and I'm sorry if I'm boring anybody out there. But we do have so many great things happening right now. We, um, you know, La Granja was a huge hit for us last yes. year. Uh, still yeah. selling very well. It's in the, you know, it went right into the top hundred games. It's now it's now my like highest ranked game out on Board Game Geek. Um, yeah. And we are coming out with a dice version of the game. So now you can play the game as a lighter, lighter, faster game uh, with one to four players. It's called La Granja, the dice game, No Siesta. And yep. um, so it's a dice selection game and you put kind of some, some pushing your luck and stuff as you're trying to get the right, the right combinations of dice. So for people who like the, that, that concept uh, of you know, kind of distilling a, a, a board game down into a dice game, this is the kind of thing you would want to look into. Yeah, and uh, the designer of that? Designer is, is the, the same. Is, is, uh, same design. Ode. Andreas Ode. Yeah. yeah, Ode, he calls himself. O-D-E, yeah. Andreas, uh, I can't pronounce his last name. Ode, he likes to be Ode, called Ode. Ode. Yeah, yeah, I had him on a, one of my very earlier podcasts. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I interviewed him about, about La Granja, because, yeah, love, look, love that game as well. Look forward to so. meeting him. He's very interactive on Board Game Geek, really. Yes. Uh, so I look forward to meeting him in Essen yeah. as well. Cool. And we made a big announcement. I was like the last game I believe that we announced for this year um, was um, called Sola Fide, the Reformation. Mm. And this is a game that we're doing with Spielworks right out of the gate. Um, Spielworks normally publishes their own games first, and then on a yep. second edition, they'll they'll um, they're a strategic partner, so we'll do the games after that. But um, this was going to be such a big release that. We were gonna. We wanted to do it together. And Sola Fide, the Reformation, is um, talks about, or the, the the idea of the game is that um, this is the Reformation that occurred uh, mostly in in Europe in general, and then across spread across the world, the um, the Protestant Reformation. Uh, so this is a happens to be 2017 happens to be the 500th anniversary of that ah. of that occurring in in. In 1517, Martin Luther with his 95 thesis, putting them on the uh, on the doors of the church, and that started you know the the schism in the church. So you know, this two player game, one's playing the uh, the ref the reformers or the reformationists, the Protestants essentially, and the other playing the Catholics, trying to stop reformation and bring the church back and reform reforming the church in a good way, while the other ones are trying to. Um, you know, split from the church. So yeah. it's a struggle back and forth across the various um, inner circles of the Catholic Church. It's very interesting. I've got a lot of buzz from uh, well, from from people who who love history and love and love you know and are, are religious. A lot of religious groups are saying, "Wow, that's a really interesting kind of thing." And it's a game we want to get into it. And the coolest thing about this one, again, in the Great Designer series, because it's from Jason Matthews and Christian Leonard. Jason Matthews being one right. of the designers, of course, of the number two game on Board Game Geek, which was number one for the longest time, Twilight Struggles. So it's mm -hmm. got some great, great designer cred there. Okay. Last game. The Last Fog game. of War. The Fog of yes. War by Jeff Engelstein. I put this in the great design series because Jeff has such a great um, um, impact, I think, on, yeah. on the game industry. Uh, being a scholar of games, uh, his podcast, he's been with the Dice Tower Network forever, and he is, you know, he is a huge student of gaming so um the fog of war is his first solo design and it is a it is a war game in the european theater but what's different here it's it's grand strategic not tactical moving units yeah. around a map it you're you're focusing on the intelligence aspects of the war at a um, so you're trying to you launch an operation you start an operation you put it out on a on an operation wheel and you can't launch that operation because you got to put you got to get more troops there possibly you got to uh, you have to uh, get you know the right assets in there so you're using cards and you're putting it on a wheel and then at some point you can launch the operation to make your attack but that operation could actually be a bluff 
Because in World War II, there was all of this bluffing going on between the Axis and the Allies. Like, uh, are they really launching it? Is, is, is it a feint? Are they, yeah. are they really going to put the troops someplace else? So you'll launch multiple operations, and then there'll be opportunities to play intelligence and to try to see what is in some of those stacks of cards. Like... Where is it? You might see where it's going. You might see what, what what kind of what asset is in there. Maybe it's a big tank division that's going to be in there and things like that. So it's all about how you uh, can determine where your opponent is going to be attacking you in Europe. It goes through okay. the first five years of um, of uh, the war from the 1940 to 1944, and uh, it's a, a victory point based game. Yeah. So really, it really exciting. Like the name of the game really captures you know, the essence of what actually happens in the game, all of the unknown stuff. Absolutely. You are, you are looking, you are, you are trying to unveil the fog of war. It's exactly what, what we tried to bring out there. Yeah. Excellent. So that's a very Sorry. long list, and I hope I didn't bore your, your listeners there. But I think, you know, the one thing about Stronghold, you know, going back to sort of like, you know, what Stephen did and why I did certain things for the company, now I, you know, I really wanted to be a game company that every gamer would say, well, what's Stronghold doing in that space? Mm-hmm. Like, you know, and I've, I've, right now, I'm in every possible uh, hobby game space. The last place I had to go or wanted to go was War Games. And this right. now, I now have a War Game there. But if you're looking for heavy Euros, you know, we got, we got them. We got Kanban. We got 504. You got these, yeah. these big, meaty games. Great Western Trail coming out. You want fun, cute, quick Light games, Fuji Flush. You want crazy interactive games, Space Cadets, and 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 the and the the Dragon and Flagon, where you're gonna beat yeah. the crap out of each other in a bar room. So you know, there's something here for everyone. Obviously, not everyone is gonna want to buy or can afford or like every game. But if you're looking for something, just check out Stronghold, and you'll see. I bet we have something there that's going to be to your yeah. taste. I mean, this is an interesting way of doing the company because there's some clients of mine, some companies who always do a certain type of game and that has its advantages because as soon as they announce their new game the fans of their games buy it even without reading the rules or even knowing anything about it because they know exactly what they're going to get what you're doing is you're offering a wide spectrum of games and any one individual will look at all of those games you've got coming out at Essen and will likely find one that they love possibly two three four but it's unlikely that somebody is going to like Great Western Trail and Space Cadets, and Fog of War, sure. and Fuji Flush, but that, that, that's fine. As you say, Stronghold Games, need, you need, if you're not looking at Stronghold Games, you need to, because there will be something there that you like. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, and that's, and that's exactly what I'm trying to do. I mean, we're building a brand. We're not building. Yeah. We're not build, We're building a brand via building lines of games, and that's, that's the strategy, and I think, that, I think I've been, been relatively successful getting there. Okay, so moving on to the questions that we've had from some of the people on my BGG Guild. First one is in from Tony Boydell, designer of... Tony uh, Boydell? Tony Boydell. He's wow. A, he's a long, I've known Tony, going back to Magic the Gathering days, I've known Tony for 20, 20 years now when we wow. just used to play Magic the Gathering on, on you know, Tuesday nights at the Games Club. Um, so anyway, Tony wants to know, now the company is off, uh, off and running, as it were, how much do you get involved in the day-to-day nitty-gritty of Stronghold Games? <laughs> and I, I, I'm, I'm guessing you get in there with everything. That's pretty the funny, actually. is what you do. Come on, Tony. Tony, <laughs> come on. This is all I do. I mean, yeah. look, I mean, Stronghold Games, you know, it, it, if you looked at the catalog and if you look what we're doing and stuff like that, you say, geez, I mean, are they buying Asmodee some, someday? You know, you, you, it looks like a bigger company than it is. But Stronghold right. Games is me. There is one it's owner. You. There's one yes. owner. There's there's barely one employee. I, I, you know, I don't it, – it, technically, I don't pay myself a salary even mm-hmm. yet, but I – but I will have to now, right? Um, yeah, I've just so, started. So. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, so uh, you know, from from the business, let's, so we you can break down any company right into various portions of it, right? Especially when the bigger companies, when when you have people, mm-hmm. and I don't, and I really don't have people, but you can break companies down into many many facets of what they need to do. From the business side of the company. That's 150% me. I mean, it's, I mean, there's everything about the business is me. Now, yeah. if you look at the creative side, I, I said it earlier on. That's not you I, at all. And I'll, me, and I'll make it very clear. I'm not creative. I'm not yeah. a creative. I'm, I, and people know me, goes like, Stephen, stop. You're a very creative guy, blah, 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 blah. But it depends on how you 
define creativity, right? Yeah, I, I'm yeah. creative in the fact that like I saw our vision in this game, and therefore I said, oh my god, this could be really good. So I mean, there's a creativeness in in a thought process, but I'm not I'm not a designer. Yeah, I'm I'm uh, I'm not an artist. It was <laughs> I drew something recently on another podcast. They said you have to draw this and show it, and we're going to try to predict what the game is and it looked like a three-year-old droid i mean if it, this is the burger king budget show yes yes did you yeah, see that i did i did exactly the same thing and my drawing skills are like a five-year-old <laughs> yeah, yeah. i drew a stick man with some hair on him I, I, yeah, my art skills are terrible if if you um if your if your child draws like me you want to bring them to like a psychiatrist or something because they, <laughs> because they they obviously need help in some level because i cannot draw so so i'm not a designer yeah. I'm not an artist. I'm not a graphic designer. Um, I'm not a. I'm not necessarily a um, a rules writer, though. I can. I can mm -hmm. obviously. I had to write a lot, and I, I can write. Um, I can write fairly well, but I don't. That's something that I, I'll have somebody else do. So um, I have to surround myself with really smart, talented people to get where I am. I could be the smart person on the business side to do all of that. You know, picking games and stuff, yeah. and making the and business the decisions, of the and, and the yeah. vision of the company, and how we want to grow it, and all that. But the rest of it has got to go to someplace else. So, you know, artistically, I go with my my man Bill Bricker. He does almost all of my stuff um, that is done like in house. My in house stuff, the uh, the stuff that we co publish is often done by like by Edgar Spiele or, yeah. or 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 Tuer Spiele. So, excuse me, they they go out there and they they go get that. Um. Uh, for rules, I have a bunch of people um, that that I'll, I'll send uh, you know the rules out so that they can vet the rules that are coming from the diner or re rewrite the rules to certain things. Um, uh, TK um, TR Knight is one of the guys yep. I go to a lot. You know T TK is a yep, very yep. awesome, gentle-hearted guy. Love him. Gary Rice, big shout out to Gary as well. Uh, and Paul and Ko, I keep mentioning Paul. He's yes. my lead. Paul's my lead developer, and you know Paul. Um, I've, I've he's one of the Paul. Yeah. One of the smartest guys uh, that I know, and I've known him for many years outside of gaming. We worked together at some small company. You might have heard of them called Lehman Brothers, who almost I've heard took of them. The, <laughs> might have almost took, almost took the world economy down. So we worked yeah. there for a long time together. That's how I know Paul. And, and then we met, and then we kind of found out that we both were gamers. He saw me on a on a video from Essen at one point, and then <laughs> yeah, it was that kind of thing. So um, so to answer Tony's question, you do roll your sleeves up and get stuck in, but on the on, on the business side of things. Everything else is pretty much project managed style. It's that's given out, as you say. That's a, really, the, that's a really good way of putting it, right? I have to project manage yeah. the rest of the stuff. Like, okay, we're in art. Okay, Bill, where are we with this? Okay, when yeah. are you gonna have this? When are you gonna have this? So yeah, you, 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 have, you, you, you do it based, based on, you know, on, on spreadsheets and making sure you have the timelines ready to hit certain things. So that's yeah. where my skills come in, exactly cool. right. Okay, Chris Dickinson. Uh, now, before you answer this question, I have a follow-up one. So he wants to know what your thoughts are on the current state of Kickstarter. And then he says, and why have you never trodden this path? And then later on, when I reminded Chris that you did, and you went down there with Space Cadets Away missions, and Chris went, oh, yeah, he actually backed that and forgot about it. So, <laughs> so yeah, current state of Kickstarter. Because I've, I've personally felt that the bottom should be falling out of Kickstarter anytime soon, and I've been saying that for three years. And I'm completely wrong, and it doesn't seem to be falling out at the bottom, and it just seems to be going from strength to strength. Well, um, yeah, the, the, for, let's go back to the sort of the, the follow-up portion first. Stronghold Games did a Kickstarter, uh, and we did it specifically to prove that there was a, a place for, for me in a specific kind of game, and that was a one hundred dollar big miniatures game. Yes. So, so that's why I did. Space Gets Away Missions has a hundred and two plastic miniatures in it. Um, so I wanted to know that if I could be the next like Fantasy Flight, if I you know was going to produce a, a a ridiculous game, and that was sort of talk about passion. That was sort of one of those things where I was like, I want to blow this game out. I want to make this game look so good. This is going to be this is like my magnum opus game. Yeah. And I. We successfully did that, so that's why we proved it. If I was going to do that game again, or do another, say I was going to do another one, another big miniatures game, would I go back to Kickstarter? I'm not a fan of using Kickstarter from a business perspective. It has yeah. lots of advantages. Don't get me wrong. So anybody out there, don't please do not say Bonacore hates Kickstarter. He doesn't. He does not. He does not. I, I understand why it's used. I get it. Uh, I don't understand quite some of the psychology of people mm -hmm. being so rapidly looking at Kickstarter versus 
just looking at other publishers' stuff. I really think that some of the people who are looking only at Kickstarter really look, need to, you know, just simply look at what's going on at their friendly local game store, or yeah. just follow the publishers that they seem to find great games coming from, and just you know buy the games you know later on. You might miss out on a few exclusives, but I I don't know those kind of things kind of just they don't sit right with me. I just right. want my games out for more people to get you know in in a nice package in a retail form, and I don't want to chase the next stretch goal and things like that. So I'm I'm not I just not a fan of the of, of that whole way of doing business. And of course it costs a lot of money to do it, right? Yeah. I mean, you, Kickstarter takes a m- pound of money, everyone everyone's a credit card transaction that takes money. So, you know, those numbers that come out, there's like, you know, eight eight to ten percent of that money goes away before you, you know, before it gets into your pocket. So yeah. back to the whole thing. What's my thoughts? I've been predicting I had, I called it the Engelstein prediction. I'm going to mention Jeff again that um, there were going to be a, a a huge to do in Kickstarter and some and money would be stolen and Kickstarter would then like collapse upon itself because people you know would realize that there's there, are, there are there are bad people out there that yeah. will steal that will steal money. And guess what? Well, we've seen some of it, and <laughs> it's not changed. nothing. Nobody cares. Nobody no. cares. No. So right, Valley Games had like. Two games with hundreds of thousands of dollars. They're all gone. Yeah. Those people will yeah. never see their games. And there's other ones too. I don't want to just point out one company. But and there was non non uh, non gaming stuff, of course. Um, it's uh, it, it's not something that I think is going to slow down anytime anytime soon. It's simply people like to be part of it. I guess they like to be part yeah. of something from the ground up. And um, since the market continues to expand so much, more and more people are entering, more and more consumers are entering, and they're entering it from various places. They're entering it from Kickstarter, and they're entering it from you know, finding out about Board Game Geek, and they're entering it from going to the local game store. To me, the greatest way to grow this industry is at the local level, at the friendly local game store level. That's where I think we are going to grow the hobby the best. Uh, right. And we're going to do everything we can support the friendly local game store. People will buy online because they need discounts. I get it. That's cool too. I'm happy you buy my game anyway. But I'm not going to grow it by people spending money online. Those guys are going to continue spending their money online. I'm going to yeah. grow it by getting people into those stores and they're going to tell their friends about it and they're going to tell their friends about it and so on and so on. That's how we're going to yeah. grow this and I'm going to continue you know, producing games so that the stores can sell them. Excellent. Okay, so a uh, question in from David. What is the one game that you felt would have been great for Stronghold Games, but it eluded you in the end, if you're allowed to share that kind of thing? You know, a business deal that you tried to arrange and you weren't able to. Didn't you, didn't you say that I can, like, not answer a question if I wanted you to? You can just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to tell people that, that Paul gave me the out, like, don't answer. You know, if you don't want to answer a question, just say so. We'll, we'll yeah, this is where, you, this is where no. you let people know you've made an exclusive deal with Games Workshop and you're now partnering. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. Now, <laughs> Fantasy Flight lost the license. I have now have it. Yeah, sorry, Christian. <laughs> So, yeah. Sorry, yeah, Chris. <laughs> sorry, Chris. I, I stepped in. Wait, so should we start talking about negotiation about buying the company? Anyway, so no. Um, uh, I've the, got an the, idea for one of them, but I was going to let you go first. Well, the, I mean, obviously, I wanted to do, and that's the zero secret on that. I obviously wanted to do uh, Richard Hamblin's Merchant of Venus, but that's we did what have. I was going to say, yes, right, right. We did have. Uh, we announced the game, and Fantasy Fight announced the game. <laughs> like, yeah, that's how I know Christian Peterson so well. And in the end, we have a great relationship because we both were so reasonable about how the whole thing. And Stronghold Games has some credit in there on, on some various things, and uh, and we didn't get to do the game. I really wanted to work with Richard, and I was gonna. I really wanted to do. Um, Magic Realm as well, uh, mm-hmm. you know, with him. Uh, but there's, it, there are just legal issues miring, miring that whole thing. Um, th- that, that's the one, I mean, that's probably, if there's one game uh, that now I would have wanted to have done is Magic Realm. Right. I, wanted to, I wanted to do Merchant of Venus. That would have been great. Magic Realm is this huge game, and we could have probably blown it out with miniatures. It could have been another magnum opus for me, but it's be due to all of the weird legal things around it it's it's just probably not going to happen sorry yeah. guys out there if that's not evident already um another game that i will quickly mention that i i really wish i would have done but i i had to pass on it because it was like it was the one just before stronghold truly broke out and essentially i could now if if, if a game is presented to me now i can just say yeah i'll do that yeah i'll do that I mean, if I like it, I can just say I'll do it. I can do anything. Okay. Because it, it, we're at the point where 
um, wh while I still have to watch my capital, I mean, it's, it's very important. If I like the game, if I want to add it to my catalog, I'll just do the game because I, I'm, I, I'm, I'll be passionate about it, as you guys can probably hear. Uh, right now. Um, so the one game that it was just too early for me to make the kind of like decision like, okay, I'll do that because my catalog was already set for the year was Camel Up of all things. Uh, wow. Which end, right? Camel Up won uh, Spiel de Jar, which <laughs> yeah. would have been kind of, which would have been kind of nice. But Spiel de Jar winners um, are bigger, are, are, are 10 times more, 10 times bigger or more uh, in Germany than they yes. are in any other location. So, yeah. so I passed on Camel Up, and it was before the strategic partnership, of course, with um, with Edgar Spiel. I passed on that, and I loved the game, but I just, at the time, I was just a little too small to just add another game sort of spontaneously right. to the catalog. Um, and I, yes, I would have done well with it, but I don't know that Camel Up now, uh, or even even you know, from from day one till till now, I don't know that Camel Up. You know, um, sold so many units that it would have changed my life. It wouldn't have. It right. would have. It would have sold a good number, but it's not. Would not even. It wouldn't be like a survive or something like that for me. Yeah. So it's a great, great light family weight game that you can play with your your buddies as well because it's a betting game, racing and betting game. It's well, a really it's a worthy Spiel des Jahres winner. Very Definitely. worthy. Some people like poo pooed it, but I thought it was an excellent game, and so I certainly wish I would have. Uh, I would have done it. Yeah. Okay, now we've mentioned Eggert Spiel uh, a couple of times, and Scott wanted to know how do collaborations between publishers work? Because you've got Eggert Spiel, you've now got uh, 2F Spiel, um, Spielworks. That's right. And, which other ones? And Artipia games. Uh, Artipia, we're, yes. We're essentially strategic partnerships. I essentially have a strategic partnership with those four companies, uh, and the, those partnerships are are not exactly the same each one of them like with Edgar Spiele, I'm committed to doing every game that they put out and I'm happy okay. to do so they're to me they're that good to me they um they are that cutting edge um with their designs everything they do with that company is, to me is like golden so I'm really happy we're working with Peter Eggert uh and his team at Edgar mm -hmm. Spiele and the beer that Peter Eggert gets from his local brewery <laughs> I got a bottle last year Ralph from Eagle Griffin got me a bottle and I don't drink beer that often, and it was amazing. <laughs> Peter so is it, um, Peter is known to be a uh, an aficionado of uh, of beer. So yes, yes, he and I he and I have that in common as well. Since uh, anybody who knows me knows how much I love beer, which is one of those things we didn't talk about in the Who is Stephen Bonico portion. I'm a, a very big craft beer guy. So anyway, right. So um, so yeah. So these strategic partnerships, as you say, is different for each one. And Egert Spiel, you will you will publish everything that that they're doing. Right. You're the other ones, you're more selective. Um, I, I'm allowed to be with Egger Spiel. It was it was like they needed they needed they wanted to work with one person that would do all their games. And I said right. I will I will I will commit to this based on our relationship and um, and and the games that I know you're bringing out. So I was mm -hmm. happy to happy to jump on that. Um, the other ones I I can I can pick and choose and use what I do what I want. But um, for the most part, I mean Spielworks is just an amazing company, and uh, they um, they want. You know, I, I want to do just about everything they do. Oh, two right. two two F Spiele, That's Friedman Friedman's company. I know. I I am now uh, committed to doing all of their games too. So that that one is just like the Edgar Spiele deal. Any one that they now have, um, and then they bring out a brand new edition, a brand new game. Those will also be uh, under the Stronghold tile. Um, so it's a little more selective with the with the with the with uh, the Spielwork stuff, but I. Almost want to do all of their games and and more selective with the Artipia game stuff, but they're they're finding some really nice, interesting things to do. We've just announced that we're going to be doing uh, Fields of Green with them, which is um, they've, mm -hmm. they've they kickstarted successfully. Um, they're going to have some of them at at Essen, and then we'll be doing a second edition uh, of Fields of Green uh, for 2017, early 2017. Yeah. Now, is it fair to say that your involvement or Stronghold Games' involvement? with these games is fairly minimal in terms of the development of the game, the art for the game, the rules of the game. It's just more uh, you'll sort of co-publish it. Is that right? That's, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, the, the short answer is I have much less to do with a game that, that is coming from one of those companies. I still want to look at the rules. I still, I still want to play them, first of all. I want to make sure they're good right, games. Okay. And we do. I play everything. So we want to make sure they're good games, and we will give some feedback. Um, but but that's the, the great part of, of these partnerships is that Stephen Bonacore 
it can only do X amount of stuff, right? So mm-hmm. I can't, I can't, I can't add all of these games that if they were internally developed or you know a designer comes in and he's got a piece of paper with some chits and some things on it, we got to take that to an actual game. That cycle is long and time-consuming. Yes. If I'm working with one of those companies. It's a partnership where they're taking they're they're taking the lion's share of that work, and then we're going to print together, and they're going to get royalty payments, of course, on on my sales, uh, and we're going to print it together to bring our costs down. So it's a different kind of working relationship, but it's one where I can get more great games into the catalog. So you're yeah. absolutely right. Excellent. A um, couple of questions in from Ben. The first one is a really nice one. It's what's your favorite part of the day during a con? Is it the excitement of the first day, <laughs> drinks after packing up, meeting friends, or you know when you've sold lots and you're at the bottom of the, you know the the pile of stock? Did, did I mention that I like beer? You did. So it's, it's, it's after packing <laughs> well, up. Well, what you know? What's my favorite part of the day? I mean, it's it's hard not to say that it's you know it's ah. <sighs> You know, yeah. after after the hall closes, everyone goes ah, you know, and then we go out for dinner and we go out for some from beer and we socialize. And then it could be with socialize with the fans, it could be socialize with the staff, and it could be just like I, I got I, I got to get away for a little while and just like you know just have, you know, grab like grab like Paul or, or Chad and just we'll just sit go have a dinner together and, and relax a little bit. But I mean, there's certainly let me tell you the the excitement of a first day doors open on the Thursday of Essen or Gen mm. Con uh, is is exhilarating. It is yeah. absolutely exhilarating, and you you know you sell more on the first day than anything else. And you know I, you know I'm there. I don't schedule anything in the in the in the beginning of one of those one of those yeah. shows. That first hour to two hours has to be me there on the front you know, getting getting yeah, on the front lines. Yeah, like I'll have I'll have several people taking taking money. You know, at make, taking money, making change, swiping credit cards um, in, at Gen Con. I can't do credit cards in, in Essen. Bring cash, everybody. Bring cash. So, and then I'll have several people dragging games out to restock, and yeah. I'll be I'll be packing games into bags to hand to the customers after they've paid. It's pandemonium. Um, yeah, and, yeah. And Essen, Essen especially. Gen Con was interesting. We had four people essentially taking taking money and giving people games. I had two people on credit cards and two people doing cash at, at Gen Con. At Essen, I'm going to basically have maybe two to three people because it's a smaller like sales kind of area that I, I have. I have a very large booth in Essen, but the way we set up, I can't I can't have that many people like taking cash. It would be it would be just be gotcha. unwieldy. So I'll have two to three people who will be able to take the sales, and then I'll have two more people packing the games up to hand to the people. Like, okay, you got these two, you got these three, you got this one, and it's boom. And then we have this like, like assembly line. They'll have somebody else running to the back storage room. Okay, we need two more cases of this. Okay, give me more cases of this. It's yeah, absolutely insane, that first, those first two hours at, um, at Essen. And that is very, very much a fun, exhilarating, and exhausting point yeah. of the day. So a quick question <laughs> for me. Have you ever seen that excitement from the other side of the doors? Have you been a punter at these events before Stronghold Games? Um, I had never gone to a large, a large scale convention uh, before Stronghold Games, so I had not okay. been in. I had not been an attendee of Gen Con yet. Um, I had not gone to Origins yet, but I'd gone to a lot of smaller conventions, and yeah. I, I've held many, many in New Jersey uh, and um, and in Pennsylvania. Uh, but I've and, and in Baltimore, and like so in the Northeast, I was an atta- a regular attendee at at all, at all these um, smaller conventions. But you get you know at, even at the smaller ones when the when the doors open uh, on on the exhibit hall, even if it's a smaller exhibit hall, there's always that fun times. Yeah. Um, but uh, I you know the, w, the WBC is in uh, uh, in Pennsylvania, and mm-hmm. I was go I was going there for years and years just just to game. Uh, Stronghold Games wasn't even a thought in my mind, and uh, yeah, there's a line for that small exhibit, uh, exhibit hall, a small vendor hall. There's a line that piles up, and uh, yeah, I'd be online too. I'd be like, oh, it's, it's ten o'clock in the morning on the on the Friday. They have a three day thing for, on, on the Friday. Let's you know, let's let's get down there and you know, make sure we get 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 some games early, you know, stuff like yeah. that. So, always. Yeah, I mean, the- I've been going to Essen. I think it's it's either 1999 or 2000. I I lost track, but yeah, I've been going every year, and of course, the first ten years of that. It was just me as a gamer before I started getting involved in helping doing demos and things like that. So yeah, I've seen it from the other side, and now I've seen it from from this side as well. I remember at um, BGG Con last year, I stood on the other side of the doors with my video camera, just 
got everybody rushing in and it, it's exhilarating uh, it, it really yeah. is so the other question that ben's got is what changes would have to have to happen in the board game industry for you to cause to pause and think about changing your career no oh, that would mean exiting Yes. Exiting Stronghold? Uh, okay, well, <laughs> well, since, since I'm now doing it solely, I think the, the, uh, the, the only change, the only thing that would, would change is if there was an acquisition, right? And this, and, I mean, the industry is so strong right now that, yeah. that everybody has a potential to be acquired. Um, right, you know, by somebody, and I don't think the Stronghold Games is particularly uh, the kind of company that most like. Like Asmodee, let's obviously the the eight hundred pound gorilla in the room. It's I don't know that it's the kind of company that Asmodee would would want to buy, um, because they they seem to buy like design houses, like the companies mm-hmm. that 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 bring up bring their own games, their own grass. You know, they they bring in a design, they develop it, and they put it out. But not always. I mean, like. Um, like 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 the acquisition of Z-Man, they have established IPs and stuff like that, and that's their bill- biggest selling stuff. For for yeah. instance, so, um, but I mean, in general, what would what would change me? What would change my career? An acquisition, but I would still stay. I would still 100% stay with any acquiring or merging company because um, you know I need still need a job. So that we yeah. always that's always part of it. You always do that. Um, there's I don't I don't I believe that there's a hundred percent that this this industry will continue to grow at this ridiculously explosive rate for for years and years. So I don't th- I don't see any slowdown whatsoever. So it's that's not going to change. Um, yeah, it's a good question, but I, I can't think of anything. Yeah, the only other thing would be my retirement. You know, <laughs> but you know, then I'd still have to like probably sell the brand or something like that. But um, I'm in it for the long run, guys. So don't uh, don't count out Bonacore. You don't count out Stronghold. <laughs> Excellent. Right now, a UK specific question: Our recent political changes that are going on in our country, the Brexit decision. Yeah. How do you think that that's going to affect the EU stroke UK games market? I don't know whether that question is from your point of view or just in general. Um, I, you know, I don't know enough about your internal economic situation. So I would, I know, obviously know quite a bit about Brexit and I know immediately the, the, that we started seeing fluctuations in the euro, mm-hmm. which uh, uh, even though you, you guys don't use the, use the euro, it affected the euro. Um, so it, it, I don't, I can't give a good answer to the question other than really my guess is that it will have no effect on okay. on me? I I just can't see it. I think I mean Britain, uh, the UK is a very strong economy. It's one of the largest economies in the world, even alone. Um, it's a it's a Western country. It's got it's got disposable income uh, for its consumers. Um, I think that it will continue to to buy games and things will go well. I, I can't see a bad a bad thing directly related to Brexit for gaming. Other things, that's your decisions to make. Yeah. You see, prices have, have gone up since Brexit, but I've heard from a number of sources that prices were going to go up anyway. Okay. And that the Brexit didn't wasn't the catalyst for the prices going up, but then I've heard of other people saying it has changed it. Because, mm. of course, uh, yeah, the, the exchange rate and everything else has changed, but who knows? I mean, personally, I don't really get involved in those kind of political discussions, but I think it's going to be years before we see the actual impact of the Brexit decision. Um, whether right. that's good sure. or bad. Who knows? Who knows? Sure. Right. Now, another question. Uh, this is from Grant and Rhiannon from Go Halves on Games. The Knights of the Stronghold. Yes. Do you have any plans to extend that outside of the US? And I have a vested interest in this, uh, this question. <laughs> well, yeah. So the Knights of the Stronghold, for those out there that, that don't know, those are, that's my demo team, right? And um, my demo team... Uh, we've branded them like that, the Knights of the Stronghold. They get nice red shirts with this big knight on them and stuff like that. But all of the management, again, uh, another shout out because, again, you can't, uh, one person can't do everything. So all the management of the Knights of the Stronghold goes through a company called Envoy. And this mm-hmm. company called Envoy, uh, run by v- Vincent Salzillo, I've known Vinny for 20 years, and oh, he's okay. the guy, he's the guy responsible for the biggest and best conventions in the in the New York City area, in New Jersey specifically, but in, in the area. And he's been running them for 20 years. So I knew from the beginning that if Vinny sets his mind to to creating this, uh, creating Envoy, 
which is essentially getting demo teams out yep. there for small for companies. Doesn't matter the size for all co- for any company who wants to join up. I knew that he could do it. I was a little skeptical at first, but I'm like Vinny. I'm not betting against Vinny. He's going to do this. So it's been wildly successful. Mm, you know, I've heard good uh, I obviously have to incentivize. I actually have uh, they're incentivized because I'm paying Envoy something to do this. There's just a, there is just a small company of a few people that organize these things. I got to get my, my, Envoy's got to get paid for it. Uh, I've got to ship a lot of games out to various people across the U, the United States. Uh, it's really it's a U.S. thing at the moment, uh, and they are then incentivized with the free game and that they have to like put they have to do so many appearances at their friendly local game stores again friendly local game stores is where we're going to grow this they go out there and they evangelize the given game and hopefully the company as well they're wearing my colors they're wearing the logo and that's the way we're going to grow the hobby now the question is can we do this outside the u.s uh, the short answer is we would we yes we want to, uh, and we've started a little with Canada, but really that's like the Canada that's as close to the U.S. as Next possible bill. because yeah. we're 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 shipping to the knights that that have like a U.S. address. They pick it up, they go out, you know, so they'll go like in Toronto because it's close enough that they can go to Buffalo, pick up the game at their P.O. box there, and then they can do it. Um, to get it truly out is is hard because of those shipping costs that I mentioned, right? The, mm-hmm. if I ship I ship a game. I ship, you know, pick a game. I take the Dragon and Flagon, weighs about three pounds, right? So a four pound package. I ship it across the U.S. in priority mail or, or ground shipment. It's going to cost me fifteen dollars, ten yeah. fifteen dollars to ship it someplace in the U.S. on average. Now to ship that game. To the UK is like $50. It's to ridiculous. Ship, at the to ship, to yeah. ship that game to Australia or to <laughs> China is like $70. It's cheaper out, to go yourself. It's, <laughs> I can put the damn thing on a plane almost. It's, just, <laughs> it's absolutely astonishing how, how bad or how much the uh, prices to ship, um, even small packages, but they're packages and they weigh a few pounds, how much it costs to ship. So that is the, that is the problem. Getting the people. Getting um, uh, people in in any of the countries I just mentioned, uh, even in non English speaking countries, to to become a knight uh, to demo is easy. I've got people yeah. just like uh, Garrett and Rhiannon asking me all the time about can can we you know we do this? We're in we're in Germany. We love your games. We want to do it for you. And and I by the way for like Essen, I I call those people that sign up at the booth, the Knights of the Stronghold. They get branded. They get the shirts, and they yep. get they get games to take home in the end. And we work with them to make sure they they've learned the games. Um, but I can at the moment get the games out in quantities, you know, at prices that make sense. Will we yeah. will we try to do so in the future? I absolutely think so, uh, but it, it's it's a it's a thing that's going to take a while to overcome the uh, the problems, the logistical yeah. problems. I mean, I, I I trialed it for you. I went to a couple of events, uh, big big cons in 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 the UK, demoing Panamax and Kanban when I had the prototypes of them. Um, right. But that that was even before the Knights of the Stronghold thing. But yeah, if you were going to do it in the UK, it would need effectively its own mini organization here. It would need you to ship. A bulk of games to that one central point, right? And then they'd be distributed to there. So it's a whole, it's a whole other thing in itself to do it. So, right, right. Now the the next question is from uh, a guy who we both know, Paul and Co. Ah, Paul. We and mentioned he wants him. to know, uh, and, I, I, and I'm not sure how serious he is about these questions, but he wants to know what are all of the factors that ensure the production of a successful game from start to finish. So if you've got another few hours. <laughs> <laughs> Paul in KO, you 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 chump. I cannot answer your question because he because you know you know the answer anyway. And uh, we know the answer. yeah, we would be there literally. We would be here for two more yeah. hours talking about all the factors. I think he was probably kidding. But Paul now <laughs> works with you very closely on a number of your projects, and he's the guy you have with you at Etten when you're getting pitched ideas from would-be game designers. He has he has come he did come last year and he's coming mm-hmm. again this year and I I value his opinion and his judgment so much on um, on Euro games specifically he's a yes. a heavy Euro player and uh, you know he is he is I consider him my lead developer yeah so oh definitely he yeah. makes he makes um, he really helps designers out there make good calls in making slight changes to games uh, based on based on his plays and stuff like that and. Uh, 
yeah, he's just great. And so I'm yeah. uh, very proud I've to have him. I had the opportunity to, to work with him on a little bit of development work with uh, Vittel Lacerda and a little bit with Watch Your Game. And, you know, I, I knew that he was a developer before speaking to him. And then when I spoke to him and I was having conversations with him and I was like, yeah, I can, I can see... I can see what you're doing here, and I've I've learned a lot of things from in in terms of game development. It's great. Yeah. Um, right. Question in from Mark. Magic Realm Second Edition launching at Essen. He obviously <laughs> uh, he obviously knows that you you wanted to publish this one. Right. Um, but, yeah. That that was a very widely uh, known thing that I hinted at and played played with people's emotions a little bit. But I really <laughs> thought that we were going to do it. I mean, I really thought we would be able to do it. But then when the SH hit the fan on Merchant of Venus. It just, yeah. it just was legally not a good idea to to, tr to go down that road. I could have, but you know, when there's people with, and it's not FFG. FFG claimed nothing on uh, Magic Realm. They were not doing it. But you mm -hmm. know, there are other big companies involved with the whole Ma uh, Merchant of Venus thing. So it's not a place that that anybody really wants to go. There's no money in this business to sue people yeah. and to be sued. So there's no reason to get down there. So unfortunately, sorry, Mark. It's it's not gonna not gonna yeah. happen. I mean, he has asked, "What would you do with it?" And you mentioned earlier on you'd put miniatures in it. But I would love of, to. Yeah, a companion app. Now that Fantasy Flight seemed to be going down that route with um, with companion apps for games, because obviously Magic Realm had very clunky combat and lots of table lookups and everything. So it's right yeah. for some kind of app. That would be pretty cool. Right, David Mortimer wants to know: Have you got any plans, you and Ignati, for a Spiel meetup? For the Board Game Insider podcast fans, uh, we don't. Uh, we are both so busy there. Uh, that would be kind of cool. Um, mm. Hmm. Uh, is there any way to do it? Um, I don't. Possibly I, not now. <laughs> I, yeah. Well, I mean, there's always ways. Like, like, like the Dice Tower. They get a room and stuff like that. Yeah. So I'm. Um, yeah. I, I just. I just don't think so. I mean, I would really. Would really like to at some point maybe do that. Um, we try. We did do one at Gen Con last year. We had a little little meetup. It was a small. I mean, maybe fifteen twenty people showed up at various points. Um, it's it's just that you know we're so busy. And then of course the hall closes and we're no. we're completely knackered. Yes, yeah. using using good good uh, British English. Completely tired. And uh, we we try to go have a nice dinner and and, and a beer and relax. So it, to stay on that whole time and to, you know to be so energetic is it, you know ties sense to wear one out. So I don't think we'll be doing it this year. Who knows? I mean, again, that's one of those things I would like to start to do. You know, because I know there's obviously a lot of UK. Um, fans of the show and yeah. the, pod, the podcast is doing well and for those out there that are listening you know who don't know about it board games insider is the podcast that ignacy chevy check of portal games and Stephen boniker of strong games do bi-weekly but now we're moving to a weekly format so oh, yeah. um okay yeah uh it was going to be uh so they can go listen to the last episode of the podcast that's going to drop on wednesday we talk about what we're going to be doing to to go weekly with the podcast excellent and the final question is from Dave. He says, as Stronghold is most obviously growing, how do you consider Stronghold Games to be different from other companies? Um, very good question. Uh, I, would, I would put Stronghold Games as being different because I mean, we're obviously more going to be more of a, a boutique shop. I'm not going to be doing huge IP games or anything like mm -hmm. that. Um, I'm, I'm a company that, as I mentioned before, is going to... Ha be that get, be that company where every gamer should come and look and say what is Stronghold doing in that in that space. That's sort of the the way that I'm distinguishing myself. You know, th there was a there was a, another small company from years ago that did exactly this. It was called Z-Man Games and Zev Slossinger I've heard from Z-Man Games. You might have heard of Z-Man Games. <laughs> Zev Slossinger from Z-Man Games grew his company by creating these partnerships and doing lots of games and lots of different games and you couldn't pigeonhole them and say oh well they do that or they do that no no they did everything and lots and lots of good games that's the kind of thing there is no more z-man in that form anymore there are much mm -hmm. much much different companies they've obviously sold the company z-man is now uh, part of the f2z entertainment group which is soon going to be part of yes. the as the day group um, which will be soon part of gaming rules when i buy them <laughs> so it's well, maybe happen i've got, well, maybe I've now got 14 pound 93 yeah, that's okay. I, I can add some so to that. So I'm, I'm, I'm getting there. I'm getting right. there. Right. So, um, so you know that that space where you know where you have a company that just just picks and chooses a lots and lots of good games and could make these great partnerships. That's sort of the space I've now and I've always spoken of Zev as being my 
like mentor, so to speak. Uh, you right. know, he was he was in. I knew Zev before Stronghold. Uh, we weren't close friends, but he was at all the conventions that I was going yeah. to, and all the New Jersey cons, and the ones I mentioned, like the WBC outside of uh, New Jersey. So, um, it, he, I looked to him as like that that guy that I wanted. I want to be able to do that. And I kind of modeled the company after that original design of his. And he certainly is a legend in the industry and has done very yeah. well, um, you know, with the company. And now has moved on to WizKids. Uh, mm-hmm. Give him a big shout out for him now running the board game division over at WizKids, which is another great company. So, And there's um, going to be lots of exciting stuff coming from it. I mean, I got to know Zev a little bit through CGE because CGE had a strategic partnership with them for many years. So I got to know Zev. And he always remembered me and that's what i was surprised you know he'd, he'd see me and say oh hi paul how are you doing i thought he, he remembers my name um but since he's moved on and since he now works at WizKids, and i've got contact at WizKids, i can't say too much but i'm having meet, a meeting with zev at essen to discuss oh. working together on some things and I, I can't wait that the opportunity to work with zev on something would just be would just be great so um the final question in from dave is stronghold games convention <laughs> yeah, we're, do, we're we're gonna be setting one up in 2017 because I have nothing better to do with my time than to like you know <laughs> go run a convention. Now I don't yeah. I don't think there'll be ever. I mean, it's funny Zev and I again early in Stronghold Games kind of uh, thought process. Zev and I actually started thinking about running a uh, a convention called and we were gonna call it Pub. PubCon, Publishers okay. Convention. Um, well, might also, be mistaken for something else. Might be mistaken for a drinking uh, convention. <laughs> but um, but we, were, we, were, we, we pitched PubCon to a bunch of publishers. It, um, it, it had some traction, a bunch of people that liked the idea, but... Is a lot of work. You have to, I mean, and, uh, and I, maybe I can even say this. I'm sure that no one's going to have a problem with it. I, I, I approached Larry at Mayfair Games. Uh, mm-hmm. Mayfair obviously being a huge, huge company at the time with their Catan property. Now they've spun off Catan to Asmodee and now, they're, now they've got their, their own sort of studio company where they've got a bunch of smaller companies involved now in, in this new, the new Mayfair. But Larry, yeah. Larry Rosni, he, he liked the idea and he was going to get the people who run Gen Con because he has a huge relationship with them to, to run the convention. But there was so much, so many logistical types of issues to deal with and stuff like that. And when do you do it? And where do you do it? And this and that. Yeah. So, in the end, in the end, it, it got dropped because of just you know um, a good idea, but so much time and effort would have to get put into that kind of thing. A stronghold con now is probably not in the uh, in the near future, but we'll not, be at, not with just you. Yeah, we'll be at many many conventions. So don't worry, uh, don't worry, Dave. We'll you'll see us at even more places. Maybe close to he said Minnesota is nice. Minnesota, so maybe even yes. close. Maybe even some close to Minnesota. Yeah, I mean maybe we can just go around Dave's house. Oh, okay. Yeah, we can do that. Hey, Dave, <laughs> send send the invite. If you fly, Con, if you fly weekend, Paul and me in, yeah, we'll be there for you. We we will be there. So anyway, <laughs> um, this was originally going to be a thirty to forty minute. Yay! Thing. We've gone on for <laughs> over an hour, but I've I've really enjoyed it, and thank you for taking your time to answer all of the questions that have come in from uh, from everybody on the guild. Um, no problem. I yeah, I mean, I've certainly learned a lot more about uh, about you because there was a lot of things that I didn't know, and um, yeah, it's it's been great, and yeah, thank I just you. Really appreciate you giving up your time. Thank you, Paul, for having me on. I uh, hope we weren't too long winded for everybody out there, but. Um, Paul, you you're you're a wonderful guy. I'm I'm happy to call you a friend, and uh, look forward to seeing you in a, just a few weeks, so we a can possibly weeks. possibly have a pint together. Yes, I'd love to. <laughs> so yes, thank you very much for coming on the show. And anything you wanted to add? Yeah, I mean, just you know, guys, just check out. We leave our release schedule prominently displayed on the front page of the website at strongholdgames.com. You can also sign up there for our newsletter on the right hand side. We won't spam you. You get about one per month at this time of year, two because there's so much going on, of course, as we discussed. Uh, follow us on Twitter at, at Stronghold Games. Very active there and posting. Uh, uh, images of the games and where what we're doing for the fans and things like that. So just look at Stronghold Games as somebody you consider to to uh, to buy games from, and uh, we appreciate your support greatly for where you have helped us take the company uh, to this point. Thank you so much, Paul, and thank you so much, to everybody else. Thank you, Stephen. Competition time. So I have two competitions for you in this podcast. The first of them is related to the interview I did with Stephen, and you can win, courtesy of Stronghold Games, a copy of Friedman Fries's new game, Fabled Fruit. To win, you simply need to send me an email to gaming-rules at outlook.com and answer me the following question. 
When Stephen explains the game during the interview, what fruits are needed to make up the drink that he talks about. And please share and retweet the competition. And the second competition is a joint effort between myself and Estevium Games here in the UK, and you can win a copy of Codenames Pictures, which is due out very soon in shops in the UK. I've got two copies to give away, courtesy of Estevium Games, and to enter this competition, you need to go and watch my official rules video for the game, which is on YouTube. I'll link it in the show notes for those people listening to this on YouTube. Or if you want to find it, just type in Codenames Pictures, Gaming Rules, Official Rules Video, something like that. You should be able to find it fairly easy. Anyway, please give the video a thumbs up and answer me the following question. In the example of play in the video, which picture is the assassin? And again, send your entries to gaming-rules at outlook.com um, with the subject line of Codenames UK and the lucky winners will be picked at random on the 23rd of September. So thanks very much and good luck to everybody who takes part in one or both of the competitions. And that's all I've got time for on the show. So thanks again to the sponsors of the show, Games Law, and to Jason Shaw at Audio Nautics for the music used in this podcast. Take care and thanks for listening.